All right, I uh, wanted to give a quick review of a Netflix documentary on infinity and the documentary interviews a lot of um, public intellectuals, scientists um, who have books, books published, popular science books. So I've read most of those books. Um, Jana Levin is interviewed and she wrote a book called uh, How the Universe Got Its Spots um, on the uh, microwave background radiation um, as the leftover energy from the uh, the Big Bang expansion of the universe the energy and um, Steve Strogatz is interviewed and he was famous for his book called Sync on uh, chaos mathematics and synchronization and um, he also wrote a excellent book on the calculus and what is the calculus and then um, the author of the jazz of physics is interviewed um, his name is uh, starts with an S I've corresponded with him it's Steph Stefan Stefan um, what's his last name anyway um, I read his book also the jazz of physics and he argues that the essentially that the fine constants get adjusted with each um, cycle of the universe um, as a new universe is created there's a different fine constants and this explains um, dark energy um, dark matter, why we can't really define it, define those concepts well, even though they make up over 90% of the universe. Um, Stefan Alexander, that's his name. And those are the three main scientists interviewed in the movie um I have I had I've had a few email exchanges with Steve Strogatz and he has a very interesting uh, commentary on infinity and each scientist is given a black sphere, a, basically like a black plastic ball. And then they're asked, you know, how does this explain infinity or something like that? And um, he says that the this sphere is actually a shadow, that it doesn't exist in terms of true infinity and he's basically expressing the platonic view of mathematics as applied to physics and um, Strogatz he has 
he's turned that around. He's expressed it in the opposite way where he said that um, fractals do not exist in the real world because fractals are a platonic ideal. So, um, the, what does this mean in terms of mathematics and science? It, it means actually that even though, even though the, um, mathematics is very precise, it's actually not accurate because um, we want what, what science is trying to do based on platonic philosophy, which is also called materialistic idealism, is to try to create, create perfection in the real world. So try to impose this platonic ideal using um, extreme levels of precision. And John, John 11, she makes a very um, fascinating commentary uh, about the black sphere and infinity and if you think of the black sphere as a Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild radius for a black hole, then her point is that there is a finite time to the event horizon. The ratio of the event horizon of a black hole as a sphere, as the area of the sphere to the, to the singularity in the black hole is it exists in a finite time on the, um, on the, uh, uh, It's, it, it occurs in the microseconds. So the microseconds is actually um, the wavelength. Um, it says a ratio to uh, kilometers in terms of the solar mass, the solar mass of the, of the Schwarzschild um, radius. Um, so her whole point is that even though the sphere is a um, infinite spatial dimension, it is a finite time, and that's what causes the, the singularity for black holes to exist. Now, what's fascinating about this microsecond um, wavelength, which is the conversion of time into a, a finite um, wavelength based on the momentum of the energy. So the momentum is directly proportional to the frequency in uh, quantum physics is that um, the microsecond is the inverse of the ultrasound frequency. So um, the ultrasound frequency has uh, recently been corroborated by um, Professor Stuart Hameroff in his research group to be a super radiance uh, in the microtubules of the of our brains 
the neurons. So the tubulins create a quantum coherence that is superluminal. It is a faster than the speed of light non-locality because the um, the metamaterial the it's the microtubule and tubulin are have a negative refractive index as a metamaterial. So this also occurs at the microsecond wavelength because the microsecond is the inverse of the ultrasound. And this is what Roger Penrose calls negative resonance. And so the same negative resonance is also the cause of the black hole singularity. And Roger Penrose's big point is that at the end of the universe, there is no scale of space because all that exists is the photons. And so then you have um, virtual photons that then they leave a gravitational wave um, signal in the future that can be seen in the microwave background radiation as as what are called Hawking points from the Hawking um, radiation, the, the virtual photon entanglement with the black hole as the black hole has a uh, Hawking radiation. <clears throat> and the black hole slowly um, evaporates. And so the source of the space-time is actually from the quantum frequency. And um, Roger Penrose and uh, Nobel physicist Gerard de Hooft recently had a big debate about this. And Gerard de Hooft, he has a, a new paper out on quantum cloning with... Um, black holes and he argues that black holes actually exist on the micro level as eternal black holes also called instantons and how this is possible uh, the the problem that roger penrose had with this is he said well where is the matter because the mat you can't have a black hole unless you have the matter that is um that's warping the space time in order to create the black hole singularity. But um, Gerard de Hoof's whole point is that the, the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole as the event horizon um, with the, in the ratio to the, the singularity actually exists on the, um, on the Compton if you look at the Compton scale on the micro scale, then there is no matter from the internal observer because the mathematics is anti-symmetric or non-commutative. And so what you have is a, a future and past um, entanglement so that from the internal the internal observer inside the black hole is only experiencing the negative frequency, um, whereas the external observer is experiencing the negative energy. And so the negative energy is defined by the three-dimensional sphere as a symmetry due to the amplitude of, you know, squaring the amplitude of the uh, complex wave of a spherical wave. But in fact, that spherical wave has an, an imaginary mass as a negative frequency. And the negative frequency is actually entangled 
with the future in the past as a time reversed uh, signal. And so there's a difference between the internal uh, observer and the external observer. And it's, it's all based on this microsecond uh, collapse time of the of the sphere of the um, infinite sphere of the Schwarzschild radius to the the Compton radius of the on the micro black hole level and um, BG Siddharth also discusses this and very similar very similarly to um, Gerard de Hooft in other words the once you go at a sub quantum level below the Compton um, level of the atom, then you have this non commutative, what they call the SU2 uh, covering. So, in, in Gerard de Hoop's quantum cloning paper, he's talking about this double, double covering. And the reason why it's a double covering is because of the one half spin in uh, of the electron so the negative energy of the positron with the one half spin of the electron the spin inherently has a time frequency uncertainty because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle but that uncertainty is due to the anti-symmetric or non-commutative time frequency that's inherently non-local and this is what Roger Penrose calls proto-consciousness and so the truth of reality is not this um, symmetrical sphere that's platonic that uh, Steve Strogatz then is claiming you know that the that the materialistic ball is just a shadow of this platonic symmetric infinity um, that's not the truth of reality. The truth of reality is actually this non-commutative flowing of time that is um, finite on an ex external level of the real world in the material sense. But in the, in the infinite truth of reality, it is an it's an infinite time that's continually flowing um, in the as asymmetry, asymmetric time, anti-symmetric or non-commutative time. So in the mathematics, you have the future and the past overlapping. And this is what Basil J. Hiley explains um, about the mistake of Richard Feynman because Richard Feynman, he's confusing the kinetic energy of mass with the quantum potential as, um, as a non-local, uh, non-commutative potential. And so once you realize that the, the um, origin of the particle as energy, frequency, momentum originates from this non-local, non-commutative time frequency, then you realize that the future and the past are overlapping and the future is secretly guiding the past from this fifth dimension that cannot be seen. And when, and as Roger Penrose points out that at this level of reality, there is no scale of size because all that exists is energy as photons. And so then uh, Gerard de Hooft, he, in his paper, Light is Heavy, he points out that the photon actually has um, a non-zero gravitational um, energy or gravitational mass. Because even though 
even though the photon is claimed to have a zero rest mass, that's actually assuming you can measure the center of the mass as an average using a materialistic um, box that would then reflect the, the light internally to, to um, try to average out the the energy, the kinetic energy of the light, but instead of the kinetic energy being renormalized as a um, an average in inside matter, in fact, the inherent truth of the light is this non-commutative potential energy, the quantum potential of the future and the past overlapping. So this is also the same point of B.G. Siddharth, who says that the, the actual um, mass, the gravitational mass of light is due to the non-commutativity of space-time itself. Um, and this, this is based on, again, the de Broglie-Einstein relation, so that the the gravitational mass is actually originates from the frequency um, of light as the um, speed of light squared divided by the the frequency of the particle. So in this case, it's the like the color the color of light based on the the wavelength, and so therefore, as an internal observer the higher the frequency of the light, the greater the gravitational energy, but that's due to secretly these virtual photons that are then being absorbed and then converted to matter on the external level. So for an internal observer, they see the blue light, but they're actually absorbing the virtual photons through this um, listening process at the microsecond wavelength and that collapses the whole universe as a fifth five dimensional five dimensional black hole that has no um, scale of size it's just inherently a holographic um, universe and then at the microsecond wavelength, you have this ultrasonic um, super luminal super radiance of the future and the past overlapping. And so it's inherently non-commutative. And that's why um, Steve Strogatz has his mathematics wrong. And I, I've, I've pointed this out to him and in emails, of course, he does. He just ignores it because all of Western science is based on commutative geometry, as um, Alain Kahn's points out. So the the scientists who finally realize that non-commutative quantum algebra is the truth of reality, then they get ignored because. Every, the rest of science is just saying, oh, unless you can externally measure something, then it can't be true. But you can logically infer this non-commutative math. And um, Professor Basil J. Hiley, he's actually constructing experiments like um, with uh, the, they're replicating the Yakir Aronoff's um, weak measurement experiments that explain how the the double slit experiment of the the wave of of um, energy of matter being inherently entangled is due to this um, time reversed um, field that's the quantum potential so the reason it's a field is because it's the amplitude is in the denominator and so as the particle the the particle is defined by the amplitude and as it gets smaller the field still 
exists as the quantum potential. So it's the time is inverse to the frequency. So normally the amplitude is defined by the wavelength and you're squaring it. And this goes back to the incorrect origin of, of matter defined by the um, squaring of the of time in order to create the the um, wavelength for sound for the wrong music theory and in order to create logarithmic irrational magnitude mathematics as the very origin of western modern science so they when that was created by Philolaus and Archytas and Plato, then they covered up the truth of the the wavelength um, as the inverse of, of momentum is actually originates from time and frequency. So the frequency is directly proportional to the momentum while the time is directly proportional to the wavelength. And so in fact, the the time and frequency is the truth of reality and not the wavelength and momentum. And so um, what the era of Richard Feynman was actually from the era of Dirac. And this is what Basil J. Hiley points out is that Dirac, he, he covered up this non-commutative time frequency in the quantum potential and he might have done it because Planck, Planck's did it originally in order to create Planck's constant because he cancels out the seconds, one of the seconds. And as Basil J. Hiley emphasizes, the only way you can derive this quantum potential is when the... Um, the geometric series of Planck's constant is squared. So it's only when you square Planck's constant do you realize that the, the quantum potential um, based on this amplitude squared is actually non-commutative. Uh, it, it originates from non-commutative time frequency. And another way to think of Planck's constant is the um, average energy of light. So when Planck, Planck was literally inspired by equal tempered music tuning as um, Peter Pesek uh, details in his book, Music and the Making of Modern Science. He has a whole chapter devoted to Planck's constant derived from equal tempered music tuning. So, um, and then uh, Juliana Mortensen she explains how um, Planck canceled out one of the seconds. And so what you're doing is, is you're covering up the fact that the time and the frequency are non-commutative when you're able to just cancel out one of the, one of the seconds. And, um, so, um, Professor Patrick Edwin Morin, he makes the same point about Planck's, Planck's constant. He says it's just, they're just claiming it's pure cycles of frequency with no energy, with, by canceling out the seconds when they convert it to, to joules. And so the, the cycle, the cycles are actually the non-local, non-commutative time frequency. It was what's called non-dualism. And so it's the, it's the ether that's the source of reality. And, um, this got covered up when, when Jana, when Yana, Yana Levin says that the Schwarzschild radius has a finite time in microseconds um that's the key that's the key clue to the 
microseconds collapse of the black hole inside our brains based on the, the meta material, the negative refractive index of the of ultrasound creating quantum coherence in the microtubules of the tubulin in the brain because at it, again as Roger Penrose points out the truth of the universe is that it has no scale in size it just exists on its own in pure time it's what he calls fundamental time and he got that he got that term from Lee Smolin who was his first physics professor was Herbert J Bernstein and that, that's the same same quantum physics professor that I had at uh, Hampshire College and so I'll just leave it at that and I want to thank the Netflix for their interesting infinity documentary that I you know it, it was Stefan Alexander Yacht Yana Levin and Steve Strogatz and and then I want to thank uh, Nobel physicist Gerard de Hooft for his recent um, quantum cloning paper and his debate with Roger Penrose that's been it was on YouTube um, and I want to thank um, Stuart Hameroff for his recent um, experimental results um, confirming the super radiance of the microtubules being having a superluminal quantum coherence. And thanks very much.